This week on The Change Law, we're talking about the recent falling out between Elastic and AWS around the relicensing of Elastic Search and Kibana. Like many in the community, we've been watching this very closely. Here's the TLDR for context. Last month on January 21st, Elastic posted a blog post sharing their concerns with Amazon and AWS misleading and confusing the community saying, quote, they have been doing things that we think are just not okay since 2015 and it has only gotten worse, end quote. This led them to relicense Elasticsearch and Kibana with a dual license, a proprietary license, and the server-side public license, also known as the SSPL. Of course, AWS responded two days later stating they are, quote, stepping up for a truly open source Elasticsearch, end quote, and shared their plans to create and maintain forks of Elasticsearch and Kibana based on the latest ALV2 license codebases. There is, of course, a ton of detail and nuance beneath the surface here, so we invited a bunch of folks on the show today to share their perspective. You'll hear from Adam Jacob, co-founder and board member of Chef, Heather Meeker, open source lawyer and the author of the SSPL license, Manish John, founder and CTO at DGraph Labs, Paul Dix, co-founder and CTO at Influx Data, Vicky Bressor, open source and free software business strategist, and last but not least, Marcus Stinkvist, an everyday web developer from Sweden. Huge thanks to our partners Linode, Fastly, and LaunchDarkly. Linode is our cloud of choice. Check them out at linode.com slash changelog. Our bandwidth is provided by Fastly. Check them out at fastly.com. And our feature flags are powered by LaunchDarkly. Learn more at launchdarkly.com. Linode is simple, affordable, and accessible cloud computing that developers trust. Linode is our cloud of choice. We trust them, and we think you should build anything you're working on, a fun side project, or that next big infra move at work with Linode. The best part, you can get started on Linode with $100 in free credit. Get all the details at linode.com slash changelog, or text changelog to 474747, and get instant access to that $100 in free credit. Again, linode.com slash changelog. What's up? Welcome back. We have an awesome show today. We're here to get community reactions around the Elastic versus AWS situation and the SSPL license change of Elasticsearch and Kibana. Elastic relicensed with the SSPL. And there's a few people on this show that believe they went about that license change the wrong way, but this is not the beginning of the story. This conversation has been going on for a while. In fact, Adam Jacob brought up the subject of Elastic and AWS on episode 353 of this show. On that episode, we talked with Adam about the war for the soul of open source, and the title of that episode could not have been more prophetic. To kick things off, we're going back to that conversation with Adam. For context, Adam is co-founder and board member of Chef, and we're talking about business models and how they correlate to open source business models, and how from Adam's perspective, the AWSs, the Azures, and the Google Clouds of the world, they provide a humongous marketing funnel for open source businesses like Mongo and Elastic. Here's the conversation with Adam. Let's talk about the business challenges commercial open source companies face. You said early in the call that things are thriving now, and we see Elastic and others out there thriving as well that have been in similar situations as Chef. Talk about the business side of things for Chef. I mean, I think in order to really go deeper into the business, we got to like just set some ground rules for like how we think about business. So like how I think about it and how I think a lot of people in the sort of modern era of software startups think about it is, you know, in the smallest nutshell, you can imagine that you have this funnel right? And at the top of the funnel is everybody who might could ever use your product, right? So every possible person who would ever care. So that's your target market. The bottom of the funnel is customers, people who pay you money for the privilege. Uh, and what you're trying to do is get people from the top of the funnel to the bottom of the funnel, right? It's just how many people at the top can I push to the bottom? And there's a ratio there where, you know, you want that number to be as high as possible. You'd love to get 100% of them. You know that you want, right? And so you're, you're trying to just extract dollar bills from the top to the bottom. There's a bunch more we could go into in terms of like metrics and high, you know, recurring revenue and all kinds of stuff. But sort of the TLDR there is people at the top, money at the bottom. So with open source, there really, we talk about it as an open source business model, but that's wrong in the same way that like DevOps isn't a job title. So like you can't, DevOps isn't a job title, still isn't a job title. It never was a job title, but we lost the war. 
you know, like there's plenty of DevOps engineers in the world. And so the idea that that's not a thing, it doesn't matter that I'm a pedant about it, right? Mm -hmm. The same thing's true in open source business models. There is no open source business model. There are business models and then there is open source. And they're two very different, very separate things. There is nothing unique about open source and business. Business is business. You get people from the top of the funnel to the bottom of the funnel. You either do that with the unit economics that make you money or don't make you money. If they make you money, then you can pour more dollar bills into the acquisition of people at the top of the funnel to get to the bottom. Even if that means you don't turn a net profit and still be a great business, because as soon as you stop burning money to acquire more stuff at the top, but you make a lot of money at the bottom, right? And so in open source, when we talk about open source business models, what we really are talking about is how do I create a channel at the top of the funnel? So people come in in multiple different ways, and we talk about those as channels. So one channel will be, I'm an open source user of your software. I download MongoDB. I download Redis. I used it. Therefore, I'm in the open source channel to the bottom of the funnel, right? Another channel would be my boss, the CIO, heard about Redis in CIO magazine, tells me you should use Redis, <laughs> right? Now I'm, I'm in a very different channel than the open source channel, right? Now I'm in an enterprise that, or like I get a, or I get a cold email from a rep that says, have you heard about Redis labs? right? That's a different channel, right? So we have all these different channels. There's a partner channel where like maybe the guy at Pivotal who was consulting on your Cloud Foundry deployment tells you that you should use Redis. That's a partner channel, right? So like we have all these different channels that people come into our businesses through, right? This is true of every business. It's again, it's not unique to open source, but that open source channel is interesting because it's humongous, right? If you're a successful open source project, that channel is full of people, right? Because lots of people are using the software. That's why it's successful open source software. So it kind of dwarfs the others in pure numbers, right? Just the, the sheer magnitude of what's possible is really high. And so when we're designing and thinking about our businesses, what tends to happen is we think about the revenue that that channel produces as belonging to us, right? If I'm the chef people, I look at that channel and I go, any chef user belongs to me. And if there's competition in, the, in that channel, I don't like it <laughs> because it means somebody else can compete with me to monetize the people that are at the top of the funnel, right? So a good example here is if I'm uh, MongoDB and I sell Atlas, which is their hosted SaaS product for MongoDB, and Amazon and Microsoft are both going to offer MongoDB as a service, that competes with me to monetize the bottom of the MongoDB funnel, right? I, MongoDB, make this investment at the top of the channel. <clears throat> I, I expect a return at the bottom, and now they're competing with me in the bottom. And, uh, and this comes back to, you know, how do you feel about that competition is the question. Because in one point of view, you're like, well, competition sucks, <laughs> right? I'm the one who put all the money into building it. I'm the one who did all of this stuff. And so you look at this thing and you're like, I deserve the money at the bottom of this channel. Well, flip that over though. The value of the channel is that it's massively huge, that it's, it's adoption. It's the, the size of the number of users is why the open source channel was valuable in the first place. If Amazon or Microsoft create services that sell what I sell, what's the impact at the top of the channel? Right? What's that do to cement MongoDB as an excellent choice for the for users at the top of the channel? Right? Um, the answer is it jacks it up. Right? Like uh, like Amazon has a chef service. They sell it for money. They do revenue share. Right? So they sell my what used to be my proprietary software, but now my distribution. You can buy it from Amazon as a service directly from Amazon. We do rev sharing together. Amazon runs and maintains that service. I promise you that my channel got bigger. My open source channel got bigger when they did that, <laughs> right? The fact that that button exists meant more people were willing to use Chef than they were before, right? The pie got bigger. So what's happening when the Redis and the Mongos of the world look at that problem is they decide that the top of the funnel doesn't get bigger or that they don't care about it getting bigger. And instead they care about the extraction at the bottom of the funnel, right? So they're nervous about it. They're like, oh, Amazon will outcompete me. They'll sell it for less. They'll bring better features. But this, to my 
point of view is completely bonkers, right? Amazon's never going to invest more in MongoDB than MongoDB. It's insane on its face, right? And the idea that that competition exists and it limits their ability to monetize is also, also to me, feels false. A good example is Elastic. Amazon's had an Elastic service running for as long as Elastic has been monetizable, basically. And Elastic went public that whole time with Amazon as a competitor. But you know what? I've ran Elasticsearch. Uh, I use it as a component in my product. One of the reasons is that it was a dominant standard. How did I know? Well, everybody offered <laughs> Elastic as a service, right? It was the de facto thing. And so that choice was easy. So I, I wound up in your channel. So from a business point of view, they're making these decisions because they believe that that's what's best for the extraction of capital or of, of, of revenue at the bottom of the channel. And they're doing it at the expense of the spread at the top of the channel. In your case, you got a rev share with Amazon. Is that the case with Mongo or with Redis or was that unique to Chef? And would that change your outlook at all if that rev share was gone? It's not the same. I don't know. I certainly am not privy to whatever negotiations they may have had, right? I know the ones I had. You know, one of the things that Amazon or any partner, anybody who's going to run your code as a service needs is the assurance that they'll always be able to provide that service to their customers, <laughs> right? And you know what's hard to do that with? Proprietary software. Because I have no... I, my only hedge is the business arrangement. Do you see what I mean? Like I, I can sign a contract that says so, but if I change the terms on my proprietary software or I build a new SKU, well, can I still run that thing as a service? Have we bifurcated it? Like what's the deal? So the mechanism there is really complicated. So one of the reasons that that rev share exists is because so much of those assurances about what's in the open was in the open, right? Even more so now. That doesn't mean that that's always what Amazon will do or, or even what they should, but that's how it worked for us. Um, if it didn't exist, it wouldn't really change my point of view. Because if the question is, can I, as the primary producer of the product and owner of the brand, and the reason that people attach to those things, outcompete someone who is essentially selling a generic version of what I sell, if I can't outcompete that person, shame on me. <laughs> like, you really can't convince me, you really can't convince a customer that the best person to service their MongoDB is MongoDB? Because man, if you can't, like there's something fundamentally broken in the value proposition here, right? And I, and I think the truth is that they can. If you look at Mongo's performance, if you look at Atlas's sales numbers, it continues to go up. It was going up before they changed the license, right? And the reason is it's a good product and it's a better product than the one that you receive if you just turn on DocumentDB uh, on Azure. Because it's kind of bare bones when you turn it on in Azure, right? And the Atlas version has all kinds of stuff that the other one doesn't have. The idea that that competition in open source, where the reason you're here is because you have this massive channel, it doesn't make much business sense to me that that's the conclusion we would come to. I understand how you get there, but it, it doesn't make much sense. Isn't, aren't disruptive products, though, not necessarily better? They're usually actually worse, but they're good enough, and the cost is disruptive. And so in the case of an AWS version of Mongo, yeah, it's not going to be as good or as maybe well supported or have as many features as Mongo's version of Mongo, but it's satisfactory and it's way cheaper. So it's disruptively cheap. And then you add to the fact that there's no, there's no R&D, there's no development costs from Amazon's side. So you're not competing with them on features. They're just free writing all the features that you're building. Well, but here's the thing. So this is where we come back to the funnel. <laughs> right. So like now we're back to the business. So like, sure, maybe Amazon, but this is why it's good business for Amazon to launch your stuff as a service instead of just compete with you directly. So like you brilliantly elucidated why they would want to launch a Mongo service in the first place. Right. But as soon as they do that, if the top of the funnel was fixed, if that, if that created no more interest in your product than it did before, then you'd be right. But it doesn't. Instead, it turns out that the single largest pool of software developers on the planet are the ones that use Amazon and AWS or Azure or Google. How many of those developers are using one of those platforms? And if your stuff is on all three of those platforms and it's not on the others, how many eyeballs do you get that Cockroach doesn't? And the answer is a ton of eyeballs, so many eyeballs. And so the size of that funnel, your possible monetization gets bigger, hugely bigger 
than, uh, than it was before. And in that moment, your ability to capture that revenue, every single one of those cut rate document DB users is a potential lead that's already using your product. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is go find them and be like, yo, did you see how much better our console is? How much better our operation stuff is? How you can get on a Zoom with the dude that wrote that indexing feature when it's broken? I dare you to get that out of Amazon. Mm. And next thing you know, Citibank is like, you know, Atlas looks pretty good. I think those kinds of ideas, though, sometimes are so seems so logical, but yet not everybody thinks like that, you know? So yeah. how can, I think this is a great idea of how could you leverage the fact that these platforms are so massive that they actually become your marketing channel for you. They are your marketing channel for you. And, and the only, the only thing you have to give up is that they're also going to monetize some number of your customers back to open sources, punk rockness, right? Like there's a, um, there's a like F the man vibe where like when you're saying that Amazon's a net positive for your business, everybody's like, but they're the man mm. and Amazon's going to destroy Elasticsearch. And you're like, dude, Elasticsearch is a worth $1.5 billion with a B yeah. and they're getting it's like that commercial where the guy's like, uh, sir, you are the man. Yeah. Remember that commercial? Like, <laughs> like who exactly are we protecting here? Cause last time I checked, they were public and killing it. Next up is Heather Meeker. Heather is a well-respected open source lawyer and a specialist in open source software licensing and strategy. She wrote the book, Open Source for Business, and it serves as a guide to open source software licensing. We're talking to Heather because she's a lawyer who wrote the license. The SSPL license is a result of her work with MongoDB, and we wanted to understand the design and the intention of the license. All right, here we go with Heather. Heather, let's open up with the SSPL. You were the person behind writing it. Is that correct? Yes, I helped MongoDB draft the license with, of course, the help of Mongo Legal Counsel and their business team. I think it's fair to say that I led the drafting of it. Gotcha. And full title of it is the Service Side Public License? Yes, that's right. Take us back to, I suppose, the early days of drafting it. What's it intended to do? What's the goal of this license? SSPL was drafted in order to meet a need in a particular way. So I'll explain what I mean by that. At the time, and this would have been late 2018 to early 2019, many companies that were providing software under open source licenses were very concerned about the use of the software by cloud services providers. And what they were concerned about was that the cloud service providers were using the software, not contributing back and not, you know, participating in the development of the software. So at that time, there were actually quite a few companies. And most of these, by the way, were companies in what I would call the platform software space or middleware software space. And they were trying to figure out what to do about that. They basically went down two different routes. The first route was the source available route in what we call an open core business model. And that's not what SSPL is. Uh, but that's where you have a core of open source software, usually under, say, Apache. And then you reserve some of the upsell elements for um, under proprietary or source available licenses. That's the route that most companies went down. Mongo, on the other hand, wanted to see if they could create a license that was an open source license, but that managed this issue. And that's how the SSPL came about. So they drafted the license, submitted it to Open Source Initiative for approval as an open source license. And eventually it was withdrawn after quite a bit of comment without a particular ruling from OSI on whether it was appropriate for approval as an open source license. What happened in that proceeding? Why wouldn't, like, what were the deciding factors? I guess they didn't reject it, but it was just like being debated to a certain degree and then withdrawn eventually. I assume it was withdrawn because they were, it was not going anywhere or was there a different reason for withdrawing it? It, it was a long and fraught debate and the debate had to do with a number of concerns. I 
would encourage anybody who's interested to go and read the archives of what's called license review or license discuss. Um, and uh, but but I'll try to summarize. Uh, understanding that there were a lot of comments and I can't summarize them all. <laughs> sure. Um, the first was technical commentary about whether the license met the open source definition. So there is a definition of open source. There's also a free software definition. Um, the One of the main tenets of that definition is that the license can't have any license restrictions. So that would be source available. Uh, if you say you can't use the software for this purpose. It also says that it can't discriminate against users or technology contexts and so forth. I'm paraphrasing, of course. So there were those aspects, and there were some comments about that aspect of the license. There were also a lot of con uh, comments about who had drafted it, the process by which it was drafted, and what Mongo's intent was in creating the license. So those were like meta comments, not about the license itself, but about the context. And so all of those things were being discussed. And if you've ever been on one of these discussion groups, you know that they get mm -hmm. discussed in a, <laughs> a non-sequential format. <laughs> um, and it can be very uh, confusing to follow. But uh, I'd say those were the main themes. Okay. And so do you think that, I mean, you're, I don't know if bias is right, but as the author of the SSPL, do you believe that the SSPL represents, I guess, even the spirit of open source if it's not officially an open source license, or do you think it's something different? Well, we drafted it to fit the open source definition. Okay. And as a lawyer, you know, you, you have to have concrete things to go on, and the open source definition is what we had. I think the discussion brought out that people felt that there was something beyond meeting the open source definition that needed to be satisfied, and there was a great deal of debate about that. So we looked at the open source definition. We definitely you know, avoided license restrictions. We uh, avoided uh, things that were uh, discriminatory according to the requirements of the OSD. But all of the meta issues were things that really kind of couldn't be addressed by the draft itself. There is some discrimination built in though, right? Or how does it actually, how does it work in order to stop that particular problem that there was trying well, to be addressed? So isn't the, that discriminating the use? I know we get into legalese here, but you're good at this. So help me understand. I would say <laughs> not discriminatory because in a way, all copyleft licenses apply different conditions when you do different things. So if you use discriminatory in that way, then GPL2 is discriminatory because it only applies certain conditions to redistributors. So that is actually fair game in copyleft licensing. Okay. SSPL applied specific conditions to use of the software I'm paraphrasing now, but as a software, software as a service to provide the same functionality of the software. And so, yes, there were conditions that were imposed in those situations that weren't imposed otherwise. But that, I think, for most people, isn't the meaning of discriminatory according to the OSD. Discriminatory would be more like you can only use this in a particular field of use, like you can use it in medical devices, but you can't use it in nuclear weapons or, or something like that. Mm. Mm -hmm. You can use it for good, but not for evil. Well, it's interesting that you say that because <laughs> there is now a, uh, a new licensing uh, movement, I guess, called the ethical licensing movement right. that actually does impose conditions based on ethical concerns and moral concerns. And those are clearly not open source licenses because they actually do impose license restrictions. In other words, you can't use the software for this particular purpose. I heard about this too, where I believe it was in China, there was a specific license about companies that didn't adhere to work ethics, where I think it was like a 999 or something like that. Nine, nine, the like, anti-996 yeah. nine, nine, license. Yeah, right. That was actually very interesting, if you'll permit me to make a comment about Please, it. Yeah. Um, 
It was, first of all, a very well-drafted license. Um, so it was professionally done. It did address labor conditions. And, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but the, the license says you can't use this software if you are violating the international labor standards. And it was intended to raise consciousness about labor practices in China. Um, but what was really interesting about that is that the license was released on GitHub. And by the way, I think it may have been more a thought experiment than anything else, but it then caused that GitHub repository to become a vehicle for people to discuss the issue. So it became all, almost like a social networking, uh, you know, initiative to raise consciousness about the issue rather than specifically to develop a licensed document. So I thought that was a very interesting phenomenon from the point of view of what happened around the putting the license in GitHub and around the development of the license. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Retool. Retool helps you build internal tools fast and easy. From startups to Fortune 500s, the world's best teams use Retool to power their internal apps. Assemble your app in just a few minutes by dragging and dropping from pre-built components. Connect to most databases or anything with a REST, GraphQL, or gRPC API. Retool empowers you to work with all your data sources seamlessly in one single app. Retool is highly hackable, so you're never limited by what's available out of the box. If you can write it in JavaScript and an API, you can build it in Retool. You can use their cloud service or host it on-prem for yourself. Learn more and try it free at retool.com slash changelog. Again, retool.com slash changelog. It's interesting how, you know, there's so many usages of licenses and you mentioned the OSI approval process and how it was contextual in terms of their Mongo's intent of the license change and the intent of the SSPO license in general. And you also mentioned, you know, the OSD and its criteria in your blog post uh, on the cause community. You mentioned how many of the legacy license in the OSI approved long ago would probably not be approved today. And then you mentioned that uh, the criteria for the approval has changed, but the OSD has not. So it seems like there's like a lot of moving targets in terms of getting approved by the OSI. And Jared mentioned like, you know, in terms of this isn't an OSI approved license, do you feel it is open source? It's kind of an interesting perspective, just the, the fact that there's this OSD that's been drafted. I think the last time it changed was 2007, if I recall correctly. But it's it, been a while It was back, a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, it, it basically, you know, hasn't changed in, in the time that I can remember looking at it. And, but I think what's interesting about that is that what OSI is, is doing is trying to create community consensus and isn't wedded to this written definition. Uh, by the way, I don't, I say that because that's what they say. It's a, a, approval of a license does not merely require it to meet the open source definition. Mm. So, it does raise an interesting question about the clarity of the criteria and the process, but, um, you know, this is a community process. So those are always, uh, uh, mm -hmm. they are living, breathing things and they get developed as they go. And people are always pushing for transparency, but it can never be, you know, perfect. The fact that this OSD document hasn't changed in a while though, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Cause you might say it's a bad thing because, it doesn't reflect the way that modern software is developed and deployed into consumers' hands. And then you might say it's a good thing because it's so strong, it doesn't need to change. The definition is so strong that, you know, it doesn't have to change. What do you think about whether it's the fact that it hasn't changed in so long, that's a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I actually agree with you. It's kind of a good thing and a bad thing. <laughs> um, it has worked pretty well over the years, and it, it's been remarkably robust over the years. Maybe it's time to revisit it, but that would also be a very long process and possibly very controversial. There are other definitions, by the way. There's the free software definition, and I and there's a Debian 
soft, I think it's called the software contract. Sorry if I'm getting that wrong. But uh, those are much shorter and less complicated. So I think if it were revised, it might, there might be some interesting possibilities to harmonize those definitions. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that whether the definition changes or not is one question. I do think that the transparency of the criteria for approval is very important to the community. Mm -hmm. What's at stake for these companies and organizations? Maybe they pick SSPL, whether or not it's an approved license or not. Like what do they win or lose based on that? Is it well, the marketing value of the term? Is it goodwill? What do you, what's at stake? SSPL is used as part of a dual licensing model. And that is something that has been around for a long time, but it's not as popular as it once was. So it was really pioneered by MySQL. And so what they did was they said, here's our software. It's under GPL. Actually, they used a variant of GPL. And if you don't want to abide by the GPL requirements, you can negotiate with us for a commercial license. And that's a process that's sometimes called selling exceptions. So the strong copyleft licenses like GPL and then later AGPL and then finally SSPL were all used uh, in other contexts as well, but as part of these dual licensing uh, initiatives. The reason that companies adopted them in a dual licensing strategy is that they were intending that people who are using the software commercially would probably have to come negotiate for a license. And what happened over time was that the MySQL model, which worked pretty well, began to break when software moved up to the cloud because the requirements of GPL only kicked in on redistribution and that wasn't happening anymore because of cloud deployment. So then companies that were doing dual licensing models moved to AGPL when it was uh, released in, I think that was 2007. Um, and SSPL is, I think, you know, a kind of a logical extension from that. So that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to allow people to use the software for certain, uh, you know, in a, in a, say, to test it out, to use it on a small scale, to use it uh, to do certain things, but to require people to come to the table when they want to do things at scale or certain kind of commercial activities. Mm. Yeah, because a cloud provider is a user, essentially, right? I mean, at that point. Yes, that's yeah. actually very perceptive comment. They are users. They're not distributors of software. Right. Uh, it's a little bit of a complicated question, but I, I don't think there's too much doubt about that. So what that means, if you look at the GPL, say, it specifically says that the license doesn't uh, control the use of software. And so that is where the issue comes to play yeah. because the cloud providers are users. And so under, say, GPL, they don't have any, you know, basically don't have any conditions at all. Right. And it's kind of odd to say, I mean, sure, they're not distributing it out to, you know, individual installations, but they are providing it to many. So it's still one to many. It's still many scenarios. So and that, that seems to be where the issue is, the, the language of the future of software, the way it is, is not so much, especially in cloud, is not a distributed model. That's it's a right. single installation. Right. The main user distribution model. has changed. You're no longer sending right. a binary or a source code to be compiled by a bunch of people. You're setting up right. a service and then charging for the service. It's just, it's a new way of doing it, newer. Yeah, and you know, copyright law treats use and distribution a little bit differently. I think that one of the things that maybe it didn't anticipate properly was use uh, was copying at scale in order to deploy software for hundreds or thousands of users. Uh, that is something that is, you know, relatively new. So as software licensing has progressed, you know, certain things worked pretty well when we were in a model where one person would use one copy of the software, but that isn't the world we live in anymore. So when it comes to the letter of the SSPL, as reactions to 
Mongo initially and now Elastic relicensing now, there have been critics. There have been, and this is a debated thing about the topic, is it open source? Is it open source? Which is, I think, is a terrible term. <laughs> I, I can't believe I just hopped on the bandwagon and used it, but this is the, you know, the verbiage that's out there. Um, there are those who think it's a business risk, this SSPL. So now I'm reading from uh, Vicky Brasseur's oh, yeah. blog. You probably have read this. Uh, and, and she says she showed it to some lawyer, some IP lawyers, and she says, by using an SSLP project in your code, you are agreeing that if you provide an online service using that code, then you will release not only that code, but also the code for every supporting piece of software all under the SSPL. It's not a stretch to interpret the wording of the license as requiring users of the SSPL software, therefore, to release the code for everything straight down to the bare metal. This is one interpretation of the license itself saying effectively that there's perhaps this collateral damage that might happen because of the way that it's written. I would just love to hear as the author of it, and I'm sure you've thought through these things, What, how do you respond to that? What do you think about that statement? Is it, is it feasible? Is it outlandish? Well, I do think it's an oversimplification of the of the terms of the license. And don't get me wrong; these um, kinds of provisions are are very complicated to read. Yeah. Uh, so it's hard to reduce them to sound bites. Um, I do think on on the question of business risk, this is the way I look at it. Um, I work with many, many companies to develop open source compliance policies. And so what companies do when they develop those policies is they have like a stop, go caution list. And you would not expect even a GPL to be on a go list. In fact, it's usually on a stop list yeah. already. And SSPL will be there too. Any network copyleft license, meaning any license that has source code sharing requirements when you deploy within over a network, um, those will all be on a stop list. So when you say it's a business risk, well, yeah, but already uh, a lot of the copyleft licenses were defined as business risks. Mm. So it's it's a you know you're not this isn't blindsiding you this this uh, this concern it's. It's known from the out, the out start. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, we you would not expect people to greenlight SSPL software. What they would do is they would look at the license and say, okay, this is okay with us or it's not, and then they would make a decision about it. So that's something that users have to decide for themselves. I do think that what you quoted was overstating the risk somewhat, but... Um, but you know, that's not useful to get into the details of it. Um, you have to actually look at what the license requires and it's really is focused on particular use contexts where people are providing software as a service. Hmm. I want to say thank you to Vicky for writing this post because I'm going to quote one more and ask you about this, but very, very helpful Vicky in, in uh, doing this call with Heather. Uh, she said, basically, in regards to the SSPL, basically, it's a hostile proprietary license masquerading in <laughs> open source clothing. Now it's getting vicious. Well, I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> Whether it's proprietary, proprietary is not open source. So, you know, this is really the same issue. Mm -hmm. I actually think if you look at the FAQs and announcements and so forth for Mongo and Elastic, you know, they're they're pretty forthcoming. <laughs> so I'm not sure what, well, what is they're trying to being do masqueraded there. there. Um, uh, so I, I think that's, you know, it's, it's language intended to incite, incite a, 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 an argument, but I don't know that it's terribly meaningful in an objective way. Yeah. yeah. The primary concern with the SSPL really is section 13, right? That's the, that's the, like a lot of the concern isn't really elsewhere in it. Obviously, it's a long license, but it's primarily Section 13, which describes, which we talked about here, which is redistribution, restrictions on usage, et cetera. Yeah, if you were to redline it against AGPL or even GPL3, you would find that almost all the substantive changes are in uh, Section 13. 
Well, Heather, thank you so much for joining us and explaining these things in ways that we could only fumble around in the dark to understand. I think it's been very helpful. And anything else that we didn't ask you or anything about the license itself or about the situation that is being discussed and debated that you want to say that we haven't asked you about? Well, I would say that I would remind people that the alternative is probably to go to a source available license. So if people, you know, are, are calling it names and so forth, you know, what they should consider is that businesses are going to do what their business strategy requires. And so most companies that don't adopt something like SSPL are going to go down the source available route, which is definitely not open source. So it's a question of whether you think half a loaf is better than none, I think. And there are definitely differing views about that. I would say the reality is that most companies are actually going to use licenses that are truly restrictive in a way rather than SSPL. So I would say anybody who is using SSPL is at least trying to go down something like an open source route, if, even if you don't believe it's open source. Up next, we're talking with Manish John, founder and CTO at DGraph Labs. Manish came on this podcast a little over two years ago on episode 322, talking about licensing and relicensing DGraph. So we thought it'd be fitting to get him on this episode as well. Here we go. So Manish, you and DGraph are in a somewhat similar situation to Elastic. You're not Elastic, but you're set up a lot like Elastic is set up. Is that right? That's true. Um, so Elastic's licensing, the way they have done it is that they have their open source code uh, co-located with their uh, proprietary code, and it's all source visible except the open source is uh, under Apache, if I'm not wrong, and then the proprietary code is under Elastic. Um, and similar to DGraph, where our open source code is Apache and the, our proprietary code is under DGraph license. So, as a meta note, where did you hear about this news, and did you read both sides? Have you read what AWS has had to say, and what's happened after the relicense? What's your your purview? I mean, I think, uh, I, I mean, Hacker News, right? Uh, Hacker News went into flames over this, and so that's where I came to know. I don't, I know, actually, I did not have a chance to look at what AWS actually had to say about that. Um, but I did read through the multiple blog posts that uh, Elastic um, sort of released about what they're changing and some of the reasonings for why they're changing. And this is a story that's, it's not the first time, right? This is the same story that we already had for Cockroach DB, we had the story for MongoDB, we have this, you know, uh, across uh, Confluent um, and uh, Redis Labs. You know, this is just a series of of changes that are happening in the in the entire open source uh, ecosystem. And you guys went through similar things as well because we even have a whole show up for you back in October of 2018 where we have you on the changelog there and back again, DGraph's Tale, an excellent name if... You're a fan of The Hobbit. Uh, <laughs> I <do>. <laughs> Yeah, like I am. Episode 322. So you've told us this story before, but like, I guess we don't need to rehash the entire thing, but this has been an area of struggle for you and, and your company as well. It, it is something of, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's such a big struggle as, as something like Elastic where Amazon is, is directly sort of like, you know, quote unquote, attacking them, right? Uh, for us, it's more of like a forward thinking uh, scenario where we... we you know, we realize that we, we love open source. Uh, and just like uh, Shay mentioned, um, the founder of Elastic mentioned in his blog post, you know, I got I got my feet dabbed into open source like long time ago and really believe in it. Um, and when I was starting DGraph, I, I was not inspired by any sort of business models, right? Like I was not planning out, hey, how would like five years from now we will make money? I didn't know how to make money from open source. I just wanted to build open source software, right? Um, and that's how we got started. Um, so similar sort of like trajectory there in, in terms of like our, our interest towards the open source community. And um, 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 so, you know, I mean, yeah, I think the open source theme is, is, is similar there. So what's happened since is that AWS has forked both Elasticsearch and Kibana and are going to carry on open source forks, community forks, as they're kind of being pitched as. What do you think about that? What 
Are they going to succeed? Are they going to fail there? Is it a real risk for Elastic or no? Um, they did that once before, right, with the Elastic uh, Open Distro. Um, and I think people were really concerned about how that would pan out. And uh, remind me, Elastic's uh, share price has not decreased uh, too much, right? It hasn't gone into a spiral downward. So I, so I guess they're doing well, right? Yeah. And they'll probably survive another attack from AWS. Um, uh, but, but I think, you know, some of the criticism that I see online about MongoDB's SSPL, um, and some and other companies is that you know these open source companies are motivated by business and and therefore they are somehow being moralistic like modest, mor- morally they are cha- being challenged mm-hmm. but i feel like you know the same people then turn around and say amazon is completely okay with doing these kind of things because it's well within their rights to do so because of the licensing put together by the open source and so the, I, I, the conflict that I feel is right there, right? You cannot have two different moral bars. Um, one for the company who is, who is making money out of your inventions and the second for the inventor themselves, right? Um, and, uh, and sometimes I just wonder, right, um, how many open source infrastructure software has Amazon created and launched in open source? Right. Like, do we yeah. when do we expect to see DynamoDB coming out in open source so someone else can build a business like Amazon has done with DynamoDB? That'll be great. Right. I mean, that'll be a great day for open source if Amazon does that. But I don't think they have any plan to do it because that's not how they operate. And so, you know, it's well within. I think I think it's in fact, I would say it's recommended for open source companies to make sure that they are able to 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 build a successful business just like Amazon is building, just like everybody else is building. Um, and so the the motivation to make money out of your inventions uh, is completely justified uh, on, in, I would say, moral grounds, right? Mm-hmm. Well, there's a concern too, uh, at least based upon Shay's uh, blog post on Elastic saying that Amazon and AWS wasn't putting back into the open source bucket, so to speak. So from two avenues, one, the perspective you just shared, which is DynamoDB, for example, is an open source, uh, and that's not part of their business plan to do that. But then the concern, and I suppose what led to this scenario we're in now is is essentially AWS not playing by the community rules. The license doesn't depict this, and that's kind of what this move is doing. It's like, hey, if you can't operate by community rules, then we're going to put a license out that makes it illegal for you to do things another way. So not pitching back into the open source thing, but then you can sort of draw some sentiment from just simply the titles of their blog post on the AWS open source blog. Uh, back in 2019 from Adrian Croft, uh, Cockcroft, uh, keeping open source open, open distro for Elasticsearch, which is something you mentioned. And then the second one is the more recent around Elasticsearch, which is stepping up for a truly open source Elasticsearch. It's an interesting perspective you've drawn there where they haven't open sourced certain things they have because of business reasons, but then wanting to be a good community player in these ways. It seems, I don't know. What do you think? It is questionable, isn't it? It is kind of questionable. And I think like, you know, if you look at SSPL, the server side uh, uh, public license, I think from MongoDB, yeah. it's actually really, it's, it's I actually, I'm still a bit baffled that it's not approved by OSI because it, it to me, is a, a fork of derivative of GPL, just like AGPL is, which also makes GPL a bit more permissive, right? I, if you look at AGPL, it's you know allows you to not have to release your source code if you are using it over the network or something of that sort. Or actually, I'm, I'm, I forget exactly the details there, but SSPL says that you know you don't have to release your source code if you're not directly competing. Uh, by providing uh, the core product as a service, right? Mm. So it's more permissive than a GPL. Um, and so I think it has all the merits, I, I feel, in my opinion, uh, to be open source approved. And and, and guess if, if SSPL in a world where SSPL gets open source approval, I don't think we have any problem here, right? Then we, then, then everybody has already sort of like gathered around SSPL, which which we could not do around the uh, commons clause, right? I mean, that was the same idea for commons clause, but it could not get us there. But MongoDB is a big name, and so MongoDB could get the industry around SSPL. And then we don't have a debate because it would be open source, right? Yeah. 
there's some details around that. We had a conversation with Heather Meeker on this exact subject and something she had said, which uh, will be in the same podcast is uh, if you redlined uh, SSPL versus AGPL, the primary differences that sort of come out is essentially section 13, which describes, you know, if you make the functionality of the program or modified version available to third parties of the service, blah, 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 blah. That's where the change is, is section 13. Everything yeah. else is essentially AGPL. And there is a lot of debate uh, around the nuance and the process to be approved. So OSD is very clear, hasn't changed in a long time. OSD being the open source definition, that's very clear because it hasn't changed. And it's even derived from Debian's uh, existing rules on what o open source definition is. So there's some history there. But the criteria and the ways that you go about getting these licenses approved by uh, OSI is a bit more difficult. You know, you can read the transcripts and the notes from the meetings and stuff, but that takes a very motivated <laughs> yeah. listener slash reader. Uh, and so some of this intention of this show is to sort of, you know, demystify some of that stuff and maybe give you a TLDR, TLDL. Too long didn't listen, but, you know, that's essentially is this criteria for getting it passed. You say that the SSPL should be or could be open source. You're, you're baffled, as you said, that it's not. Yeah. Yeah, and, it's not, and, and that it hasn't been approved by them. Yeah, and, and to be honest, like I haven't looked at the counter arguments to that, right? And uh, I'm sure there's there are smart people there right. on, on on the other side, and they have some counter arguments. But from a, from a slightly like you know distant perspective, without having to go into the intricate details, it seems very similar. And um, maybe if it was built in 1990s, it might have already been um, involved in uh, in OSI, right? But I think one thing that 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 we should probably take away from Elastic's um, stuff is that the, the holy grail of license here is to is to uh, so if you look at Elastic license as well, right? It's it's divided mm -hmm. into two portions. One is the the open source part, and the other one is the completely proprietary part, right? And so proprietary part they are not changing from my understanding. They are changing the open source part of their code mm -hmm. and making it available via either SSPL or the Elastic license. And both of them sort of in some shape or form disallow building a, a competing service, right? Right. Um, yeah, it restricts cloud service providers from offering, this is quotes. Yeah. That's what it says. Restricts cloud service providers from offering our service as a service. Right. And, and that's in violation of OSD6. And and they are very clear about it's not it's only to third parties, not for internal usage. So if, if I am a big company and I need to build a product, I can provide it as a service to my other teams in the company, just not to your users directly, right? Um it's a commercial restriction. Don't compete with me, essentially. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Right, because you can compete internally in, inside your own company, yeah. not make any money from it, but get great usage of the software. But you right. can't create a competing company right. against the inventor. Yeah. This goes back to what you are saying before, the yeah. inventor or the user of the invention. Exactly, yeah. And, and, and they can still build a, a commercial product on it, uh, just not a competing service, right? Um, right? But the holy grail would be to to offer a single license, right? That that is that that takes away. Hey, this is proprietary part of the code, and this is the quote unquote open source or similar to open source part of the code. Uh, ideally, what what looks like what they want to get to is to offer a single license that can cover both their free and their paid features while being as open as possible, right? And that's the that's the if that would be there, like I think we would jump on it immediately. Because we also currently have dual license, which is what Cockroach has, which is what uh, Elastic has, and you know many others have. Uh, but having that single license would be would be the holy grail. And I don't know if you wanted to talk also about BSL, right? Which is the MariaDB's um, license, where they say that uh, the the initial code is gonna be. Uh, uh, proprietary, but after a certain amount of time, three yeah. to five years, it would become open source and it, it would become Apache 2 or something liberal, which is what Cockroach is doing, um, mm -hmm. Cockroach DB is doing. So they're open source, they switch to Cockroach BSL uh, modifications, likely. You know, that's also like a, a, a great way to but essentially say the same thing, right? Which is, you know, uh, please don't compete with us by providing a service which is uh, providing a service to our core product, right? Like, um, yeah. you know, and, and if you think in terms of what's the core product for Amazon, 
you know, let, let's say let's say like e-commerce is a core product, and if you were to like use Amazon machines to uh, or Amazon technology to actually build a competing stuff, I'm pretty sure they'll be pretty pissed mm -hmm. as well. And so, so all these companies are doing is that we have spent a lot of time and effort into building, and this is our main source of source of living, right? Right. Let just play play nicely, right? Otherwise, yeah. we have to invent new licenses. Yeah, David Kramer shared some of his sentiment on that subject because Century. Uh, was licensed BDS3 and transitioned to the BSL. And I'm paraphrasing, but what I can recall from that conversation, episode 371, Relicensing Century, was essentially David was saying, I want to do whatever it takes to help me run this commercial business, but also respect open source. Yeah. Because without the business making the thing, there is no thing. And that's a paraphrase of yeah. David's sentiment on that. But that's essentially what he boiled it down to was his concern in regards to transitioning away from BDS3 yeah. to uh, the business the business source license, which you mentioned. Yeah. And actually, if, if you think about what, what, is, what is happening, right, like, you know, um, I mean, again, I, I argue that SSPL is very close to open source, to, to, the, to the AGPL or GPL, right? But SSPL is not open source. So what's actually happening right now is a bunch of open source companies um, which truly believe in open source are having to switch to quote unquote non open source licenses, and that's not that's not great, right? Yeah, and yeah. that's not great. And the funny thing is, they are all talking about the same one player in the market, right? They're not talking about about a Google or about a Microsoft or anybody else. In fact, in the Elastic blog post, they mentioned that they have played very nicely with all the other players in the ecosystem. Just the um, just the AWS, right? Um, Much so I, I have no personal. AWS. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I have no personal thing against AWS, right? Like, it's, we we run on AWS, we are completely fine. Um, and from what I understand, they're not trying to build a degraph alternative, right? Uh, but uh, it, 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 there is something there where if a bunch of companies are talking about the same, you know, quote unquote, yeah. Curious actor. actor, yeah. yeah I was I say, let's I call him an actor. I don't want to say a bad actor, right? Because <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, right. Uh, because we just don't know. But but a curious actor, I think there must be something there, right? Do you think then, given that what you had just said that the OSI that it's in their best interest for open source to help these businesses that have this concern, have this trouble, to create an open source license that gives them the needs they have, the to to sort of solve solve the needs they have these problems, but also adhere to the letter of open source. Because if you look at the intent, it seems like they're intending to respect and live within a world of open source, whether it's for the, in quotes, open source brand name that can't be trademarked because it's not trademarkable, but it certainly has a marketability to it. Like if you, uh, if you masquerade as faux, faux open source, is that right, Jared? Faux open source? That's right. Then you're not open source, and but there is a your there's a marketability to saying you're open source, for sure. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think you know we, we do open source because it allows it's it's not just a way to to have more eyes and make sure that the product is the the score is of high quality and so on and so forth. But there's also it, it's a distribution model, right? It's a distribution model. It's a way by which you think your software could be consumed by anybody without necessarily having to pay you, right? And again, they're not saying that if you build a commercially successful product using our software, pay us. They're not saying that. They're just saying, like, just don't build a competing service against us. Um, and and also, uh, going back to the first, the, 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 the initiation of a bunch of these open source companies, it started with, like, one or multiple like people who just believed in open source, right? They they just wanted to make things in open source because they have consumed open source software their life, right? So when I was like in college, I was all into Linux and I was playing with Gen 2 and Ubuntu and I don't know, like whatever other Linux flavor there was out there, FreeBSD, NetBSD, and I just believed in open source. Um, and that was our stance against, you know, Windows at the time, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so... I've created multiple projects, uh, uh, some of which actually got popular, including DGraph. Uh, and then we have Badger, and then we have Ristretto, and they are all open source because we just believe in it, right? Um, right. It's a bit of like a pain to, to have to move away from that, even in theory, right? Even in theory, right. um, just because of this, uh, this one mm -hmm. problem. So Manish, clean slate, 
start DGraph over today, same exact software, same business, pick a license. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> what are you going to go with? Uh, I think SSPL is looking pretty attractive. SSPL is looking pretty attractive right now. And and also, like, just, just notice one more thing, right? Uh, from 2010 or 2015, the world has changed to be more cloud first and on-prem later than on-prem first and cloud later approach, right? And so if I were if, if I were or somebody else were to build a service today, they might choose not to even make it open source. They might say, you know what, Snowflake has done really well uh, by being completely cloud-based system. And if I'm not wrong, Snowflake is not open source, right? Um, and so so why open source, right? Mm. Maybe, that, maybe that could be, be the question is like, open source already has tons of problems because there is, you know, actor or multiple actors like causing so many issues. Like why bother with all that? Just avoid all of that and just go completely closed source. And you could still build a good business out of it, right? And so that then it becomes just a question of principle, right? Do you mm-hmm. still really believe in open source? Do you still believe that your code should be, we should be, other people should be able to check it and make sure that you're not doing anything fishy or help you find bugs or, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so it becomes a matter of principle and a matter of uh, business, it seems like. This episode of The Changelog is brought to you by Render. Render is a unified platform to build and run all your apps and websites with free SSL, a global CDN, private networks, and auto deploys from Git. They handle everything from simple static sites to complex applications with dozens of microservices. If you're a developer or a founder that's frustrated with AWS's complexity or Heroku's high costs, you owe it to yourself to use the $100 in free credits they're giving our listeners to give Render a try. Render is built for modern applications and offers everything you need out of the box. One-click scaling, zero downtime deploys, built-in SSL, private networking, managed database, secrets and configuration management, persistent block storage, and infrastructure as code. Heroku customers running production and staging workloads typically see cost reductions of over 50% after switching to Render. Here's the best part. We work closely with the team at Render to ensure you have zero risk by giving you $100 in free credits. Plus, they're going to assign a world-class engineer to your account to offer guidance and answer any questions you have. When you're ready to transition your infrastructure, they'll be there to help you with that too. Automate your cloud hosting with Render at render.com slash changelog. Get $100 in free credits to try the Render platform, plus a world-class engineer assigned to your account to guide you along the way to send an email to our special email, changelog at render.com to get access to those free credits. All that begins at render.com slash changelog. Coming up in this segment, we're talking with Paul Dix, co-founder and CTO at Influx Data. Paul shares his perspective on running an open source business, how Influx Data is innovating their commercial offering while having a permissive MIT licensed version of InfluxDB. Paul also shares his thoughts on this standoff between Elastic and AWS and why he's long on Mongo and short on Elastic. Here we go. So Paul, tell us, tell us your name, tell us your company and kind of your view of the open source world, where your opinion is coming from. Uh, yeah, so I'm Paul Dix. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Influx Data. We're the makers of InfluxDB, which is an open source time series database. Uh, I created it in 2013, and I've been uh, initially running the company and then as CTO, uh, which I'm still doing to this day. So my experience over that time has basically been trying to build a business around uh, an open source software project, particularly in infrastructure software and in databases in particular. So Elastic, obviously, I'm very familiar with. I saw it when they you know, were initially becoming a company. I remember the project early on. Some of the work that they've done was you know, served as inspiration to me as I was building out Influx and the various parts of our stack. Mm-hmm. Very similar software, very similar business model. It looks like Influx is MIT. Can you tell us like your license selection and how your business works around it? 
Yeah, so all of the open source software that we create is MIT licensed. And our business model is basically, so we are essentially at this point an open core business. So there's open source in FluxDB, which is MIT licensed. People can do whatever the, what they want with it. Uh, it works essentially as a single server. We have a fork of the open source project that is closed source and proprietary. If you want high availability or scale out clustering of InfluxDB, that is our commercial offering, right? So essentially, we don't put clustering features into the open source. Everything else uh, is fair game to go into the open source. If it has to do with a single server, optimizing query performance, APIs, functionality, all that kind of stuff, it goes into free open source. So we we launched this as a you know managed service inside of AWS in, I think it was April of 2016. We launched it as basically like on-premise software product that people could buy in September of 2016. Um, our AWS service is still running to this day. Essentially what that is, is it's the closed source software uh, spun up, you know, a customer can come and sign up. They say what size, you know, instances they want, how much storage, how many instances. We spin up the, you know, the closed source enterprise version of our product on it. We add monitoring and backups and stuff like that. And then, you know, that's, that's the hosted version of the product. The, what I say, on-premise uh, version is essentially you buy the software from us. It's an annual subscription. And then you run and manage it yourself. And that's either in your own data centers, but plenty of people are also doing it inside of AWS, GCP, all that kind of stuff. Last year, or I guess late 2019 now, we launched basically version two of our cloud product. And that essentially is, um, it's a very different kind of thing because it's not just a database and it doesn't look anything like the open source software that we create. The API is the same, but the underlying like architecture and how everything works together is completely different. Uh, and that's for version 2.0 of InfluxDB. So the model we switch to with 2.0, we essentially move to a cloud first model. So we deliver that cloud product continuously as like a SaaS service. And then over time, some of those features get pulled out into the open source in FlexDB. Is that because of a realization that the other way wasn't working well enough or it's just, why did you switch to the cloud first model? Um, mainly because it has nothing to do with open source versus closed. It has everything to do with software delivery cycles. So before we looked very much like an enterprise software company, we'd have anywhere from two to four feature bearing releases a year, which could then you know get shipped to our cloud customers and shipped to our on-premise customers. The problem with that is you don't get that many cycles of iteration and each release is like super painful to do because there's so much code wrapped up in it. So I really wanted to move to a continuous delivery model so we could get much faster feedback, features out to customers quicker, and the individual releases would be much, much smaller. So that had to do with basically wanting to be a cloud company and deliver a cloud product mm -hmm. as opposed to deliver like a packaged on-premise enterprise product. How does that trickle down to your open source then? How does InfluxDB, the open source, benefit or not benefit from this, this switch? Uh, I think the benefit is that by the time something lands in open source, we've already vetted the features and vetted like its functionality and how it works inside our cloud product. The thing is with our cloud product, we're able to, we're able to iterate on it uh, and release fixes very quickly. Once you ship something in an open source release, it's much more painful to, you know, ship a fix, ship an update. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a benefit. Um, the, the drawback is, it's less, I think it reduces the collaboration with the community in terms of what we're developing and how it's getting done and all that kind of stuff. It may, basically makes like the open source like a downstream kind of product, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that reflects the tweet you put out, which is uh, my own preference is to keep open code permissive and open and have a clear strategy as you just depicted here with how that code will be used in the commercial offering. So it, you're eating your own dog food, which is good. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so there's what I just described is basically our 2.0 model. But actually, mm -hmm. I'm actually trying to move even beyond that over to what I call basically like 
complementary software model, right? So we have a new project that we announced a few months ago called ImpluxDB IOX, which is basically the new core of the database written in Rust using Apache Arrow. And the way that we're building this out is essentially there's the open source thing, and then there's another piece of software that we have that is closed source. And as a whole, the system is designed to be two pieces of software, one of which is totally open and permissive, permissively licensed. You know, you can do whatever you want with it. You can compete with us. That's fine. That's by design. Um, and then the other piece, which is the software that we're writing to be able to run the open source software in our cloud offering. So the reason why I say it's complementary is because what I want is... I want our cloud product to be running the open source bits exactly as is, like exactly as the open source community experiences them, because it mm. means we'll find bugs faster. Uh, it also means we can have more of a collaborative effort with the community in terms of making improvements, because we're not like right now with our cloud two offering, like ImpluxDB 2.0 open source is one project. Cloud two is totally separate. Now we use some of the libraries from InfluxDB2, but it's not like it's not even like a fork of the project. It's literally two separate pro, uh, you know, projects and products, and they have the they have like the same API. Yeah, two masters. Right, exactly. Yeah, with with IOX and in this terms other of piece. serving two masters. Is what I mean, like literally, you're serving two masters. You have two different projects. It's very difficult to serve both easily. Absolutely. I mean, and like internally, we have a separate team that works on the open source bits versus the people working on the cloud, closed source cloud product. Right. Uh, actually, the benefits of the open source, and it seemed like the benefit of the open source was obvious, but that they're different because they're separate. That's what it seemed like. I was going to ask you about that because it seems like with your cloud too that you mentioned, you can obviously push forward, but it's, it's downstream. The open source is downstream. And it seems like maybe, you know, just disconnected basically. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit disconnected. Whereas like with this new model, again, like my goal is so we offer it as a cloud product first. So that's we're not doing that yet. But then later we'll offer it as an on-premise product. But the idea there is that people who adopt IOX and you know deploy a bunch of servers and stuff like that, if they come to us and they want the on-premise product, it's a product that they add in addition to the open source software they're already running, right? They continue to do that. It's very, very different than our old InfluxDB 1.x enterprise model, where our enterprise product is a replacement for the open source InfluxDB, mm -hmm. right? I think that's a like a heavier lift, and it's a bigger ask for users to replace their open source bits. Like it's better, I think it's better if they're able to run the open source bits and continue to have that experience because one, it makes the contribution easier. It makes it easier for them to consider adopting a commercial product because at that point they're saying like, okay, I have this commercial product, but it's not like I'm still using the open source bits. So I can still be sure that, you know, if the commercial relationship goes sour or I decide I don't like want that functionality, it's still good. I can still continue to use the open source bits. There's definitely some interesting ramifications that I think I would love to see play out as you as you go about deploying that new idea. Am I understanding correctly? It's kind of like uh, the open source bits is like the core uh, software offering, and then the the proprietary stuff is like uh, like a management controller or like a deployment type of a thing. Like it's all the things are, that surround it that you would be offering as a service, perhaps, but this is as a licensable. Addition. Yeah, or? that's a good way of thinking of it. It's so yeah, we okay. it's basically all this code that we have to write to offer it as a service, right? Operations, right. backups, like deploying new versions of it, management, all this kind of stuff. The the other thing gotcha. is we want to be able to offer that as an on-premise piece of software. Another way to think about this is IOX represents the open source thing represents the data plane, whereas our closed source product represents the control plane. But the way the two interact is the control plane interacts with the data plane through its public API. And that public API right. is open source. So literally, if somebody wanted to write an open source control plane for it, or if they wanted to write their own competing software product, mm -hmm. they can do so. And the license totally permits that. Yeah. And the thing is, like, we don't have to worry about 
our open source bits competing with our commercial bits. Because the truth is like, right. there's like the, the responsibilities of the two pieces of software are clearly delineated. So it's like, there's no reason for people to put control plane bits into the main open source project. They would have to create a separate open source project to do it, which would make sense. Mm -hmm. Right. But at that point, you're kind of just deciding what is control plane and what is data plane. And that's kind of the same concept of like what goes in core and what goes in proprietary, isn't it? Like, what about backups? Well, it could go right into our core offering, but it's more of a control plane kind of a thing. So we'll put it over here. It seems like you still make those decisions. You just make them in the, the two pieces of software are further apart, perhaps. I, I, I view them as further apart. When I think of open core businesses, I think of businesses where the commercial product is a replacement for the open source product. This, mm -hmm. this is not that, and it's designed specifically not to be that. Like, take Datastax, for instance. Datastax Enterprise is a replacement for Cassandra, right? And now, like, Datastax is obviously off offering it as a service called Astra. That's doing well. But again, like, that's an open core model. Gotcha. I think, so so about, I think, I think a good example is, like, uh, Google and Kubernetes, right? Like, Kubernetes, open source Kubernetes certainly doesn't represent the entirety... <laughs> doesn't represent the entirety of uh, GCP and all the software that runs that. But, like, obviously Google has a vested interest in, you know, driving Kubernetes forward, and mm -hmm. GCP happens to be, like, one of the best places to buy Kubernetes, to, to operate mm -hmm. Kubernetes. So what's your thoughts on the, the server-side public license and Elastic's move? You obviously pr prefer this other way of going about it, but... Do you think this was smart by them, short-sighted? What, what's your take on that? <laughs> so I don't think it's, it's not the move I would make. And, you know, to be totally honest, though, like to me, it's not really about a license choice. It's more about how they intend to drive innovation that drives, you know, commercial value. And the truth is, like, I own stock in MongoDB, which is obviously SSPL licensed software, but I do not own stock in Elastic, nor would I buy stock in Elastic right now, yet I'm holding MongoDB, right? Even though they, they're both SSPL. So like from a pure, you know, mercenary investor perspective, I'm long Mongo, but I'm short Elastic and it has nothing to do with the license. I think okay. them changing the license is more a symptom of the fact that they're getting out innovated on their cloud offering. If they had a cloud offering that was demonstrably better than Amazon's Elastic Service, they would continue to be able to drive revenue and drive people to it. Mm -hmm. If they're so upset because they feel like Elast or sorry, AWS is eating their lunch on the hosted offering, then then they, you know, they change their license. Like, I mean, ultimately, like they had a choice, which was they either write more closed source code or they relicense their, you know, the, they, they, they continue to write code out in the open. I'm putting air quotes around this. Uh, but that code is under a different license. They chose the different license path, which to me, I think, I mean, personally, I, like, I'm not a fan of source available licenses. I think they're a disservice to the community because... Because then... <laughs> like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah they're just... Over there. Yeah. <laughs> They are a disservice to the community because then you can say like, oh, community members like saw your code or whatever. Like it just means that people can't start like competing projects with you without, you know, putting themselves at risk of being, you know, accused of taking your code or whatever. Right. right. Like I prefer right. open code is open, closed code is closed. And the, the thing that kind of annoys me about the whole elastic AWS standoff is both of yeah. them are trying to, you know, put forth this position that they have, you know, more the moral high ground. They're, you know, they have moral superiority over the other one, right? Like Amazon saying like, oh, we're protectors of open source, so we're going to launch this fork or whatever. And the truth is like, even when they did open distro, I called it a fork then, even though they said it's not a fork because it's just like whatever, a build. It was, all, it was always obvious like when they launched that, that Fork is what it was ultimately going to become because Elastic was going to take the stance that Amazon's stealing from us, so we're going to change the license of more and more of our code, which is then going to give Amazon no choice but to fork. Right. Right? 
So Amazon's claiming they, they have the moral high ground. It's not true. Like they, they just, they're just doing what's best for their customers and their share, shareholders, right? They're trying to optimize shareholder value. And obviously, like all their customers are saying, like, host Elastic for us. And then Elastic is trying to say, like, oh, we're doing this to protect ourselves from Amazon because they're stealing from us. I mean, the truth is there are tons of hosting companies that have been hosting Elastic for a long time. And if you look at where Elastic makes its money, it's probably mostly from log search. How many log search companies are built on top of Elastic? And they just open that up, right? Like, so it's their Elastic is just upset because Amazon outcompeted them on the hosting front. Whereas like other hosting providers like Compose and Avon and stuff like that didn't really make a dent in Elastic's top line, right? So their claim like, oh, we have to do this. Like, no, you don't. You could have kept the code Apache V2 and you could have like written more and more code in your service offering that's closed source and kept the two separate. Right. And this is actually one of the things that I agree with Amazon about, where they said the reason they created the open distro was because Elastic was polluting the open source repo with code under different licenses, right? Under the Elastic license and stuff like that. And what they've done now is they've gone all in on that strategy. So basically, like, they want all the benefits of being an open source company, you know, free marketing, free adoption, getting other people to talk about it, use it, whatever, but they don't want to pay the price. The price of being really open source is that you're giving software away for free. Yes. Being permissive. It, you're being permissive, but that also means that anybody can take your software and compete with you, which you have to be yeah. okay with. Like, any, any re anything that you can really call a platform is only a platform if the total economic activity of it outstrips that of any single vendor, right? So mm. if you claim you're a platform, but basically you're getting all the money from it, no, you're not. Like you're... <laughs> a monopoly, as you said in your tweets. Right. This comes back to something you were saying, which in your stance for not 2.0 in terms of influx and what you're doing, but the next version, I think you called it IOX, this maybe version three, I'm not sure what you call it, but you said by design. It's uh, permissive and you de you've designed your architecture in terms of commercial offering to expect other competitors. Whereas it seems like Elastic, based on what you say and others have said and even kind of what they're depicting is that they're upset that Amazon is eating their lunch and it's not by design. Their model is not by design to be competed with. Right, exactly. Like their their hope was that they would get this massively popular project, which it is. Elastic is top 10 database project, right? Like used the world over. But then they want like the classic strategy is like you spend a bunch of money to get optimized growth. And then once you have scale and a monopoly, you want to start collecting monopoly rents, right? So now Elastic can't collect mon monopoly rents because other people are hosting Elastic. They're, so they're trying mm -hmm. to change the model so they can do that. But the problem is like, then you're a different sort of business entirely, right? Like it's fine to be a closed source database company. There's Fauna, which is new. Firebase is closed source. Like the each of the cloud providers has a handful of closed source databases. Mm -hmm. So that's a totally fine thing to do. But to try and say like, oh, we're open source and, and then change it, it's just like... I know, it's kind of ridiculous. Well, Paul, fascinating stuff. Uh, thanks for sharing your your take with us. Definitely want to come and have you back once you've rolled out this new, what do you call it, complementary model. Um, yeah. And have some real world results to report back how it's going, if it's serving the needs of you and your users and the open source community the way that you hope it will. We would love to have you back on the show. Yeah, I think that's uh, just one closing thought on that really quick, which you reminded me of, which is like, I think... For people to think about, it can open permissive open source licensing survive in infrastructure software? I totally think it can, but I think the people who are producing it have to think ahead of time about how they commercialize it over the long run. And for us with IOX, I've already defined what success looks like is tons of competitors, literally cloud providers adopting the software and competing with us. So what that, which isn't going to happen for years, best case scenario, right? If it happens at all. But what that means is we are developing a commercial product side by side with the open product right now so that if cloud providers decide they want to get in on the game three years from now, we've already had plenty of time to actually build a product 
to, you know, compete. Mm. Stay tuned for results as they come out. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> we really appreciate you coming on the show. All right. Thanks, guys. Next, we're talking with Vicky Brasor. Vicky has been in free and open source software for 30 years now, and she's been working with startups and enterprises doing open source and free software business strategy for quite a while. We use Vicky's post titled Elasticsearch and Kibana are now business risks as a reference on this situation. And we even quoted her post a few times in our conversation with Heather Meeker. So naturally, we had to talk with her. Here we go. All right. So we're here with Vicky Brasor. And Vicky, share with us, first of all, uh, your position in the open source world, like what's your angle at the, the conversation that we're having? Where are you coming from? Um, I do corporate strategy around free and open source software. So I work with startups and enterprises and various organizations to help them be more successful by contributing, releasing, and uh, just generally becoming a good citizen in free and open source software communities in a way that's both good for their bottom line and for the communities. Okay. And you've been doing this for a while? Sounds yeah, like. I have. I've been in free and open source software for over 30 years, and I've been doing this specific thing um, for, yeah, quite a while now. Awesome. Well, we're glad we got you on the show then. So you wrote a piece called Elasticsearch and Kibana are now business risks. And once you lay out the case for that headline, do you want to share that with our audience, just the, the brief synopsis of why you believe that's the case with this server-side public license? Well, I mean, SSPL, I'm going to leave to the lawyers. Um, this is a legal matter, but it is not an open source license. It is, however, being portrayed as open, which everybody is going to interpret as open source uh, because that's just the way we speak about things. So I think that in and of itself is kind of deceptive and that's a problem. Um, but the bigger problem is that this is a license change. And mm. uh, if you are going to use something, you are agreeing to that license. If you upgrade... Elasticsearch or Kibana to, I believe it was 7.11, if I recall. But if you upgrade, you are tacitly or otherwise, you are agreeing to this new license, SSPL or Elastic license, it doesn't matter. You're agreeing to that and you are taking on new obligations for your company, for your organization. Are you aware of that? Do you know what you're taking on? Do you know the potential risks you might have? Or maybe there are benefits. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But this is not something that you as a company can afford to ignore because it can have huge ramifications to your code base. I see. So like the side swipe is, is a big problem. The fact that so many people might upgrade and unbeknownst to them, their agreement with the software that they're running and the companies involved has changed. Is there no transparency to that change? Is, the, is it not something that people are aware of or how does it, how does it play um, out? The only transparency really is going to be that blog post, or I guess there's like two blog posts now with uh, Elastic finger wagging at Amazon um, and also screwing over their entire community and ecosystem. But hey, that's their strategic decision to yeah. make. They seem to think that was the right move for them. Um, more power to them. Uh, yeah, that's really the only warning. Um, you're otherwise not going to know. As far as I know, I haven't obviously looked at the code, um, but it doesn't make any sense that there be some sort of a new click through on Elasticsearch and, and Kibana, for instance, um, as you're installing them on your server, how are you going to confirm that? Yes, I have seen that there is a new license. And yes, I agree with this new license. Nobody does that, not for open source software and especially not on the server side. Um, mm. So it's very likely people are going to upgrade and tacitly agree to this, whether they know it or not. Or maybe they know about this new license and that they decide not to upgrade at all. Well, now you're not getting security updates to this software, to Elasticsearch, to Kibana. That's another potential risk to your company. Um, maybe you're using these things for free and a great deal of people build a lot of cool stuff on top of the Elk stack. There's a reason why there's an acronym that we all know, the Elk right. stack. It is that popular. So a lot of people mm -hmm. are building on this and they might be building on the free version. Um, well, that free version is not going to get relicensed and you're going to be screwed. But if you are building a company on top of this open source software and your company relies upon it and you're not already paying for some sort of support, either from Elastic or someone else, you're also putting your company at risk in that way. So there's a lot of real really important strategic things that people need to be considering when they are selecting open source software. And you need to be remain aware of your entire free and open source software supply chain, because as we are seeing right here, 
it can shift out from under you. You can have license changes. You can have security problems. You can have maintainers who just, you know, peace out and they go away and suddenly you're using something that's completely unmaintained. So there's a lot of risk there for a company. And most companies I've worked with are completely unaware of this. And it's, it's hmm. uh, potentially a disaster waiting to happen. I mean, as we all know, this is what happened with, um, oh, that uh, credit reporting thing um, starts with an E. Equifax. Equifax. Thank you. Uh, yes. Now I've been saying elastic so often. That's all I can think of. <laughs> that's, the no, that's the only E in your. We're brain, here yeah. for you. Exactly. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, that was Equifax was not paying attention to their open source software supply chain. You know, they had a uh, piece of software in there. I believe it may have been Apache Struts or something like that that had been upgraded to fix a security hole, but they hadn't bothered to upgrade it internally because they weren't paying that much attention. And then they got compromised and billions of people had their private information stolen. So if you're not paying attention to stuff like this, not only Elastic, but the larger picture, you are just one bad day away from being the next Equifax. And do you want to do that? Is there a right way that Elastic could have done this in terms of just forget the the decision, the SSPL, but like, let's say I just want to change my license. Is there like a, a correct, you have to like start a new project with a new license. Is there like a best practices for changing a license that doesn't sweep, sweep out the rug from people potentially? Um, for an open source project, there, there's obviously many different ways you can do it. And Elastic has their perspective, which is going to come from a very, you know, corporate perspective. We're looking to make money. Um, and then the community will be coming from a different perspective. So it you can have different approaches. But the one thing everyone should always do is be communicating with their community and their ecosystem. This caught everyone by surprise. That shows that Elastic is not respecting the community and the people who have been contributing and who rely on this software. So they have essentially looked at their ecosystem and said, yeah, we don't care. We don't care what you're doing because all we want to do is screw over Amazon and collateral damage be damned. So they should have communicated. They should have told people this is going to be coming. Maybe they should have done it, for instance, at uh, version 8.0 rather than version from 7.10 to 7.11. Yeah, go to a major version. Maybe that would have been smarter. Um, maybe cut a major version right there. Just do that. Maybe you could have forked it internally and start developing internally and then leave the open source project alone for other people to build upon. And you can even, you know, push stuff upstream and pull stuff downstream. You can still benefit from that while having your proprietary internally uh, developed software. You can still do that. I mean, there's lots of different options they could have done, but the one thing they should have done and did not it was communicate with their ecosystem, with their community. They popped this on everyone and it was kind of rude. They've mm -hmm. violated the trust of their community and that you can't really get that back at this point. So yeah. you kind of screwed the trust of your community and you've besmirched your brand, which is going to be incredibly difficult to fix. It's a somewhat too elastic credit. And maybe I'm wrong by even saying this, but it seems like they've gone through a lot that when Shay had mentioned the CTO of elastic mentioned the litigation and the behind the scenes discussions I think from the outside, it might be easy to say screwed over, but the nuance there, I think, is they've gone through a lot and maybe they're in some ways quite wrong and reactionary, but I'd say in some ways, at least depicted by these tweets and this post, maybe they went about it wrong, but their intention was to try to fix this problem, which is very difficult to fix because our permissive license, license does allow this competition and maybe from a business standpoint, they've sort of hit their links with being able to take that in quotes, their quotes at least, abuse from Amazon. And they're just trying to tread water to some degree with the scenario. Uh, I know that this is a podcast and so people can't see me, but picture me rolling my eyes right now. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the trademark thing aside, that's a different matter. That lawsuit for the trademark is a separate issue. If they are right. relicensing as a a reaction to that, then it's essentially them stamping their little princess foot, taking their 
ball and going home. And it's a childish reaction to a trademark infringement lawsuit, which you know, I, I do think that they are, I mean, they were totally justified in that lawsuit for their trademark infringement against Amazon. I have absolutely no problem with that. I do think that Amazon was rolling the dice on that one um, and they lost. And I think they will lose in, in that particular trademark thing. But I am not a lawyer. So right. um, that's just my, not, my yeah, educated not legal advice. Uh, yeah. right. um, that's just your take. So, uh, but the relicensing, you know, if they screwed up at the very beginning by not understanding what a permissive license allows and what that is, they, they screwed that up. They put it out there under a permissive Apache 2 license without thinking somebody can now build a better product offering on top of this very easily. And if they're building a better product offering than we are, I'm sorry, folks, we live in a capitalistic system. That's just the way these things go. It's your fault for releasing your intellectual property under that sort of license and not understanding what it's going to mean. And if you did understand, not taking enough measures to make sure that even if that does happen, you can still be successful. And frankly, if you look at their numbers and their financials, they are doing quite well. So yeah. what are they looking to do? How are they going to looking to grab all these people who are using the Amazon ecosystem and move them over to Elasticsearch and to Elastic? I don't think that's going to happen from a market yeah. perspective. So I, it's very difficult to see strategically why they thought this might have been a good move to just give their entire ecosystem the finger while trying to take a shot at Amazon. It just, mm. it, it kind of seems, I don't know, amateurish. And I would have expected better of a company that's been around for this long. So let's say I was a happy Elasticsearch user a month ago. And here I am today and I'm like, Vicky, what do I do? They, they changed the license on me. I don't know what to do. Do you say, what do you say to that? Go to the Amazon fork or? I, I will say, I don't know. It depends. Of course, I'm, I have been known to do a fair bit of consulting. And so any consultant <laughs> who isn't starting out with it depends, it depends. is, yeah. you know, uh, trying to sell you something. Um, right. So it totally depends. What are your needs? How much do you rely on that Elasticsearch or on that Kibana? We have to remember there are two really big projects here that have been relicensed. It's not just Elasticsearch. So mm -hmm. what is the strategic value and the architectural value of that piece of software to your product, to your company. Look at that first. What is the niche it is filling? And then will anything else fill it? And it could be that as you evaluate this and you look at it, it makes sense to just pay Elastic for their software. Fine, that is a valid choice and I support you doing that. I want your company to be successful. But you might also find that there are other alternatives. You might, there are a couple of forks now. Um, there is as we all know, the the thing that kicked all this off, which is Amazon's open distribution for Elasticsearch from the last time Elasticsearch did something kind of goofy in their open source world. Um, and then there's they have their new totally open distribution that Amazon just forked. And I think there's a third one, um, which is from logs.io, something like that. There's at least one other uh, version out there. There may be others. And maybe you don't need Elasticsearch at all. Maybe you just need Lucene. You know, um, yeah, if you're using Kibana, yeah, exactly. Maybe Grafana would be better for you. I don't know. It depends upon your needs. Don't go doing something just because it's what everyone else is doing. Look at your needs, your company, your architecture, your budget, your staffing. Who knows what software do you have to ramp up on something new? There's lots of variables in there and so i can't give yeah. a one-size-fits-all answer i was hoping i could exist. just ask you once and the whole community could just listen to you you know <laughs> oh, let's, uh, let's multicast let's multicast the solution oh no there is no single solution to any of this sort of stuff because every one of these companies is going to be different if they were all the same then we wouldn't need them all right we we'd have one market one company boom you're done but we don't have one that. license one Too license easy. gosh wouldn't that be oh my gosh yeah. that would be so easy that would be so <laughs> nice but that's not the way to do. We wouldn't need a consultant at that point. Uh, well, yeah, but I do corporate strategy. It's not simply about ah, licensing. Okay. It's about so <laughs> much more than that. That's just a tiny sliver. Well, Vicky, we want to respect your time. Is there anything else that you want to share that we didn't ask you? Any questions that like you just want to put this out there that 
we haven't asked you a question to, at least? Uh, no, not really. I think you've you've covered pretty much the highlights of the stuff, and it'll be interesting to see what others have to say. Um, yeah. on the, I don't typically listen to podcasts, but maybe I'll actually listen to this one. We'll hey, see there that. we go. Well, you might hear me thank you at least once before I thank you right now for your time, but uh, thank you really for your time and for this blog post that you shared. It was very helpful for us to sort of get a different perspective on these concerns around open source. Quoted a couple of things you'd mentioned in your blog post in a conversation with Heather Meeker, which is a part of the show too. But thank you for your post and also to today. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, gang. Last up on this epic show is Marcus Stinkvist, who self-describes as an everyday web developer from Sweden. Let's do this. Please tell us who you are and your vantage point on the software world. Yeah, well, I, I'm just a normal, everyday web developer from Sweden. Awesome. Uh, my name is Marcus. So I work for a small company no one has heard of yet. Yet. There you go. Yeah, exactly. How did you first hear about the news of Elastic's relicensing? Just curious, like, where do you get your info? Yeah, well, I, I read an um, article from Elastic on uh, Hacker News. So okay. I saw them posting, like, uh, this is not okay or something in those lines. Awesome. Well, we're gathering perspectives from all over the community. So it's awesome to have just a regular, everyday web developer here on the show. So welcome yeah, and yeah what do you think what are your thoughts on the whole situation there's lots of nuance lots of ins lots of outs yeah exactly exactly uh, well I, re I read a lot of comments and i read the, the amazon article as well when they posted about uh, like forking mm -hmm. the repo after they relicensed uh, elastic and i i really don't even use uh, elastic or amazon web services okay. that much I, <laughs> but i i think I, I care a lot about open source in general so Mm -hmm. So I'm with you. I don't use AWS. I don't use Elastic. I also care a lot about open source. What is it about open source that you like or that you care about and are trying to preserve or be a part of? That's a good question. I think it's uh, the matter of fact that I can use stuff for for free and like share with uh, colleagues and people all around the world without any restrictions. Uh, no one is like can forbid me from using stuff which I want to use. So when you first heard about the relicense to the SSPL, what was your hot take? What was your emotional reaction? Were you indifferent? Were you mad at Elastic? Did it feel like it's no longer open source, or do you still think it's still in the spirit of open source? Um, well, I think uh, I, I'm actually very much on the Elastic side. Uh, for me, okay. I, I saw a lot, of, a lot of comments on uh, hacking news that were like, "Oh, Amazon is all in their rights and yada yada." But uh, they have they have actually done the same uh, with MongoDB a few like two years ago, I guess. Right. Where they pushed them to basically relicense uh, because they simply don't want to pay, I guess, their fees. And they, yeah. I, I, I think Amazon could. Could it be a, a, a bit more friendly towards those open source companies? And because mm -hmm. right now when they uh, use use their products for free and maybe they, they hurt the possibilities of future open source companies going forward. So if you were an Elastic user, an Elastic Search user. Yeah, I, I have been in the past. You have been. But, but, but if you I, were today, like when you read the relicense, you would have been pro-Elastic. This would not have concerned you or offended you or change the way you looked at Elasticsearch? Well, I think it's sad that they have to do it, that, that they have to relicense, that they feel like they need to. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's what makes me think that their move is kind of okay anyway, because I would still support them and I would rather use them than the fork created by Amazon. Yeah. So the fork still exists under the, the new fork, which is created by Amazon and trying to carry on from that point forward. I think it yeah, still I'm, exists under the previous license, but you would continue with Elastic versus the Elasticsearch and Kibana forks that are run by AWS now. Exactly. And that's um, simply because I believe in their vision or I believe in their product. And I, I think uh, Amazon is going to have a hard time keeping up or maybe they won't. I, I'm not sure, but time will tell on that. Yeah, time will tell, of course. 
Uh, but it, the same goes with uh, MongoDB uh, and their document DB, I guess. I still think uh, MongoDB is a superior choice uh, just because it's their project and their their vision. So the so you're not an open source purist then? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. No. More pragmatic. More about free and open and available. Have you thought about any of the other licenses like the source available licenses? Are you cool with that? And these other things like business source licensing? Surely these are things that you've read about being in the open source world. Are these things that you're also just like, whatever you want to license your code as, if I can use it for free and contribute back somehow, it's cool? Yeah, I think it's cool. Like every license is their own choice. If you want to licensed your work in a certain way it's your choice and uh, if you want to share your work with others that's just a positive thing and uh, i feel in this case like amazon is hurting uh, the possibility to do that awesome anything any other thoughts um no i think uh, you uh, people that uh, are on um, like amazon side should maybe read the article from frederick Lordney, Lordney, or something like that. Okay. Uh, which is like on TechCrunch called AVS gives open source the middle finger. I think that's an okay. <laughs> article that sums up my views pretty well. Awesome. Hand that off to me and we will include it in the show notes for everybody. Yeah, sure. Appreciate you hopping on and sharing your opinion with us. Yeah, thank you. That was an epic episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you haven't heard yet, we have a membership. It's called Changelog Plus Plus because, hey, why not increment things? It is better, as they say. You can subscribe at changelog.com slash plus plus. Get closer to the metal. Make the ads disappear. And, of course, support all of our podcasts. Again, changelog.com slash plus plus. And, of course, huge thanks to our partners Linode, Fastly, and LaunchDarkly. Also, thanks to Breakmaster Cylinder for making all of our awesome beats. And, of course, thanks to you for listening. We appreciate your attention. We appreciate you listening. And one more step you could take is to join the community. Changelog.com slash community. It's free to join. Come hang with us in Slack. Call this place your home. Changelog.com slash community. That's it for this week. We'll see you next week.